United States at the moment, for example. If you look at Italy or Germany, they only have about 63-64% of the population in work. As a consequence, their welfare systems are under tremendous financial strain. If, if above a decent minimum wage, you have people in work, as far as possible, in good jobs, that's the key to delivering the resources which will pay for the things that people need. Education and health, but also investment in anti-poverty programs, attempts to increase greater equality, produce greater equality in our society. I'll come back to that issue a bit later. Third, third guiding principle of New Labour is make a distinction between the state and the public sphere and place reform of state institutions at the top of the agenda. The tradi traditional left tended to say, well, we need the state to oppose the market. But actually, you need to reform the state and you need to recognize that the state and the public sphere are not the same. The state can be too bureaucratic, it can be too top-down, can be unresponsive to <coughs> the needs of those who use um, state services. And you can have other groups, such as third sector groups, local community groups, who also deliver effective welfare and other public services. So, for me, New Labour did not stand, as so many people seem to think, for expanding the realm of markets as such, creating a more privatised society, but the opposite really, building a stronger public sphere, but recognising that that public sphere is not the same as the state, and the state can be a barrier to it. Hence, the sort of character, excuse me, characteristic um, emphasis of New Labour that um, you you must invest in public services because Mrs. Thatcher left this country with two fundamental problems. <coughs> rising inequality. Inequality rose during the Thatcherite period more than any other industrial society apart from New Zealand, which also followed kind of Thatcherite policies, and run down on public institutions. Labour has tried to rebuild the public domain, but um, has done so by trying to couple investment with reform. Wherever you invest, you must also reform. Now, there are many questions that have been raised about how effective Labour's reforms have been of the education system and the health system, but nevertheless, it is an important guiding principle, I think. Fourthly, and perhaps most controversially, one of the guiding principles of, of New Labour differentiated it from the more traditional left, was that you shouldn't leave any areas of politics to be the monopoly of the right. Traditionally, the right had been strong on issues of identity, um, national identity, um, migration, and crime. And to some extent, the economy too. People used to trust the Conservatives with the economy, they didn't trust Labour with the economy. New Labour tried to rectify these things and to argue that a left or centre party must have policies oriented towards the issues surrounding migration, the issues surrounding crime, must be strong on the economy and must also deal with issues surrounding national identity and sovereignty. These things have been very controversial but they have been very important in sustaining Labour in power. The principle, if maybe not always the practice, has been you should look for left of centre solutions to quite to quote right of centre <coughs> problems. So when Tony Blair invented his famous soundbite, well if he, he didn't invent it actually, but I mean he popularised it, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, it was a significant thing because it argued you must have, as it were, a two-pronged approach to crime. You can't just simply suppose, like many traditional leftists tended to, that crime will disappear once you get a more equal society. Even if it did, you still got big problems of criminality in the here and now that people often, especially in poor neighbourhoods, have to deal with. So, the principle you must relate to people's anxieties, because sometimes these anxieties are built upon realities, the same thing applies to the problematic aspects of migration too. 
very hard to get kind of position on these things that will be convincing. But nevertheless, where left the centre party didn't do so, they found themselves out of power, and sometimes they found the countries in, in question swamped by a rise in right-wing populism. This happened in the Netherlands, it happened in Denmark, it happened in Austria, happened to some degree in France. And you can see what happens if you don't have an approach to these issues, then the society can get in significant trouble from the rise of an aggressive populist right, which in some countries is now directly part of government, even though I think that would never have been acceptable in previous generations. Will Gordon Brown keep these principles? Yes. I think, therefore, where we stand at the point of transition from Blair to Brown, Brown has made it clear that he will sustain a new Labour outlook in these four dimensions, however much he fiddles around with um, the particular details of them. Beyond that, however, what, what has Mr Brown got to do? Well, I argued in this book, and I argue now, that there are three, if I can stick with numbers, there are three kind of basic um, phenomena that Mr. Brown has to deal with or changes he has to make. He's begun doing some of these. First of all, the first one is re-establish trust um, in himself and in the Labour government because partly because of well-known catastrophic errors in foreign policy, partly because the Iraq issue overlap with people's feelings about Mr. Blair not being wholly trustworthy, not always telling the truth and so forth. Mr. Blair left office under a very considerable shadow. He, he, his popularity was a fraction of what it was in 1997. And Mr. Brown has tried to deal with this partly by not being Mr. Blair, by being a different kind of personality, by rejecting Mr. Blair's so-called style of sofa government, but also by introducing constitutional reforms. I mean, I should have been in the Parliament today listening to the Queen's speech. I thought I was giving this speech tomorrow, on Wednesday, <coughs> the condition I agreed to come and do it, so I've missed what, what Mr. Brown actually said. But an important part of it must have been constitutional reform. Constitutional reform, giving back more powers to Parliament, um, making sure that you have safeguards for liberties, um, introducing changes in the balance of power in the country, those sorts of things must have been in the Queen's speech, as I'm sure I'll find out tomorrow. And um, they're, they're an important part of Mr. Brown's attempt to kind of re-establish more effective trust in government. Um, they include reform of the House of Lords to have a uh, fully elected house or something close to it, um, a reform which certainly I also support. Um, so that, that's one major element of Mr. Brown's programme and I think basically the idea of looking at a Bill of Rights, um, looking at a Charter of Human Freedoms, there is quite a lot of mileage in these things although they might be difficult to realize in practice. But there are two other big things that he's got to do that I think he's not doing so well on. Um, the second one is the existing commitments of Labour which have not been met and which mean that there is a hole at the heart of the new Labour programme. I'm thinking especially here of inequality. The new Labour certainly tried to introduce policies that would alleviate inequality. Above all, it made a commitment to reducing child poverty by half by 2010 two and a half years away from now, and eliminating it by 2020. The goal of eliminating child poverty is not a utopian goal because you can say the Scandinavian countries have more or less achieved it. Probably the lowest you can get child poverty is about 4 or 5 percent, and that's what the UK should be aiming at, but that already has been achieved in the Scandinavian countries. However, the government is a long, long way short of realising its interim target. 600,000 children have been lifted out of poverty, but it should have been over a million um, by 2005. And all serious students of the subject recognise 